Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. It is great to have you with us on this Thursday. As promised, Jay Lehman alongside. I am Dave Revson. Happy to be working with you and fired up for our Saturday nights. We're going to have a lot of fun. We are going to have a lot of fun, yeah. man. To be on Saturday night with Dave Revson is an honor. So I'm, I'm excited <laughs> that I get the chance to watch all the football games and talk about them. Although sometimes briefly because we got a lot of teams and growing. We'll need to get you a dictionary so you can look up the definition of a true honor. But, I, <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm fired up to, yeah, to have you. We're going to have a, a, a ton of fun. Yeah, early on. It's a lot of games. A lot of games. And then as the year goes on, maybe we... we well, September is always like that. Yes, it's just yes, stacked upon yes. stacked upon stacked on the non-con. I love how we mix in some conference games as well. Speaking of which, we are one week away from kicking off the season. That is our big story. Let's look at the schedule on opening weekend. Football kicking off next Thursday over on Fox. Conference clash, Nebraska-Minnesota. All five of the Big Ten's ranked teams in action on Saturday Triple header here on the network, starting with Purdue and Fresno State. And then there is actually one game Sunday, Northwestern and Rutgers in Piscataway. Uh, we decided we want to focus some on defenses today. This is fun. an area where the Big Ten has been so good yeah. year in and year out. And one of the teams that has really set the standard to me has been Wisconsin. Sure. And we saw Jim Leonard, but again, picking up from a defensive philosophy, really, that for the last year, uh, 10 years or so, had been outstanding, and now you've got a transition. you got Luke Fickle, who, of course, is a defensive right. guy himself, taking over. Mike Tressel had elite defenses in Cincinnati. Yeah. What is your sense? Like, How much of what Wisconsin does this year do you think will resemble what they've done in previous years versus Mike Tressel bringing in some new stuff? That's a great question. I, I look back to what Mike Tressel's done, not only at Cincinnati, but at, but at Michigan State. And that's been elite defensive back play. They had elite defensive backs. I think Trey Waynes. I think Darquez Denard. Some of those great Spartan defenses under Mark D'Antonio. Mike Tressel coached those guys up. But I also look at the DBs they had at Cincinnati, right? They had some elite defensive backs at Cincinnati that were high draft picks. And so what I want to see is first great defensive back play. Let's talk about Luke Fickle, though, as well. I mean, they had some great DBs at Ohio State when he was defensive court, right? Yep. Right? I mean, so I think they're going to do great on the back end. I know that Wisconsin has been kind of known for that 3-4 or 30 front, whatever you want to call it. I'm not too concerned about that. I mean, it's on any given personnel uh, that the offense runs, you could have three guys down, four guys down, five guys down. I think Wisconsin has been known for the edge rushers and linebackers, but I think it starts in the back end, an elite defensive back play. Fascinating to see what this looks like. One thing that was interesting that came out on our visit, Luke Fickle was telling me, that his defensive staff had actually gone to Madison a few years ago to exchange ideas with Jim Leonard, had incorporated some of the stuff that Jim Leonard was doing. Right. Presumably, Jim Leonard incorporated some of the stuff they were doing, too. So maybe not as foreign in terms of kind of swooping in and, and taking over. When you talk about great defenses last year, you have to talk about Illinois and Ryan Walters. Now he is the head coach at Purdue. Sure. He brings Kevin Kane with him to yeah. be his defensive coordinator. Purdue was not great defensively a year ago. They were kind of up and down, frankly, right. under Jeff Brom. What do you think in terms of getting that system going right away? How tough is that for Ryan Walters to improve this defense from the word go? I think it's difficult. I mean, he improved a defense in 2020, uh, 2020 to 2021 that was, that yeah. was horrible, right? Yes. So he did it very Dramatic fast. Change. But he had big bodies up front. I don't know if they have the size in Jack Sullivan and Branson Dean up front like they had with Johnny Newton, Calvin Avery, uh, Keith Randolph at Illinois. And my big question is, is how does this defense work in an air raid system that Graham Harrell might be running, right? Yeah. So much of what he did was complimentary football with Brett Bielma. And I love that Illinois uh, led in scoring defense under Ryan Walters, but they also had limited amounts of snaps. They controlled the game with Chase Brown. How does that work in the air rate? That's a big question to me. What do you think of that? Because I mean, we, we asked this question right. when we were at camp. And, you know, I think Ryan Walters just believes that you want to run an offense that's difficult to defend. And, and, I, and so that was his notion behind bringing in the air raid. But... But do they go hand in hand? I mean, like, how hard is that to do to have an elite defense yeah. when you have an offense that can be hit and miss, that could be boom or bust, right? Could be off the field in three plays. I don't think we see a lot of examples of an air raid offense with an elite defense. I don't know why that is. I have some, some reasons why I think. And that is, it's very hard to play aggressive man-to-man -man coverage, play in and play out 
when I'm back on the field after a one-minute drive from my offense that got eight yards, right? right? And he loves to be aggressive, loves to bring pressure, likes to bring a lot of bodies, but he leaves his defensive backs on an island. And when you have Devin Witherspoon in Illinois, you can do that. When you have Sidney Brown, a draft pick, you can do that. I'm not sure they have the bodies or manpower to play that kind of pace offensively and still play the aggressive style that they played in Illinois. I could be wrong. Uh, right. they, they could be fantastic. And if you're scoring points, maybe it doesn't matter. But we know that sometimes you don't always score and the ball goes right back. This is kind of where it's going, though, in right. college football, right? The sure. air raid attacks and more wide open. And so, well, even Wisconsin has yeah. an air raid guy. Yeah, no, I know. It's like, no, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, speaking of the, the team that Walters left behind, let's focus in on Illinois. Sure. You said, I mean, the top scoring defense in the country. Right. To turn it around in two years, I mean, they just were not good defensively sure. at all under yeah. Lovey Smith. And so now, uh, Illinois, to me, was partly scheme, right? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't think you can discredit in any way no. what Ryan Walters did, but you mentioned it. Like, it was partly talent as well. Sure. I mean, they've got great guys up front. They had three defensive backs right. picked in the top three rounds yep. of the draft. So you lose the scheme guy. Yep. You still have Brett Bielema there, who clearly is a yep. defensive mind himself. You lose a lot of the talent certainly on the back end, not up front. Give me a sense of how you think this group fits together. I think it is scheme. I think it is tell. I also think Brett Bielema has shown he's a great developmental guy. He right. develops guys, right? I mean, there were some bodies there from Lovey Smith's recruiting class, but those guys went to another level, especially in the back end. A lot of those guys aren't there. I think it's been well documented. They've got one of the best fronts, if not the best front in the Big Ten, one of the top fronts in the country. The defensive backs are going to struggle. We know a pass rush will help them. But surprisingly, when you look at the numbers for as elite defensively as they were from a scoring defense perspective, they didn't have a great pass rush as far as sack numbers. Now, they got good interior rush from Randolph and Newton, but Gabe Ackes, Seth Coleman, Alec Bryant, guys, they think can really take the next step. They brought in Charlie Bullen uh, from the St. Louis, uh, excuse me, not St. Louis Cardinals, the Arizona Cardinals, right? The Arizona Cardinals to be a pass rush specialist because... I felt if you read between the lines, I thought that, not that Kevin Kane didn't do a great job, who's now at Purdue, I thought Brett thought they left a little meat on the bone when it came to pass rush. They had some pressures. They they, they just didn't have the sacks. Here's what's interesting. I was talking about this with Wani the other day, and it feels like, and maybe you disagree, but it feels like kind of people are starting to look at pass rush a little bit differently. Like they were second in the nation in hurries. They were top in the nation in quarterback pressures. So... Even if you don't always get to the quarterback, I mean, to impact the quarterback, do you buy into kind of some of these metrics? I would say, I would say that the quarterback was definitely impacted. They had like twenty-eight. I mean, they led Power Five in picks. I mean, the the number, yeah, right, the number of picks. So yes, you benefit from it on the back end, right? The number of interceptions they had speaks for it, right? But I thought in some of those games when a sack could have turned the game, and they had some close games, right? They were unable to get to the quarterback. When they were playing Michigan State or they were playing Purdue, they were unable to get pressure on Peyton Thorne, who was the quarterback, or Aiden O'Connell. They they just had all day back there, and they were able to make some throws and some plays to move the ball down that field, at least to extend drives and not – the defense wasn't able to get off the field. So I believe that Gabe Ackes, I believe they're really high on Seth Coleman, even the, uh, Alec Bryant, who transferred from Virginia Tech a couple of years ago, highly recruited guy. Those three guys have to apply pressure from that edge position. He loves those outside linebackers. He loves them. Right? He says they're a great group. absolutely loves them. We're going to talk with Tim May here in a bit about Ohio State. Sure. I want to get into the defense with him. But I find this one really interesting right. because – this is a defense that, frankly, was really good last year until it wasn't. Right. You know, like they were, they, they were an elite defense for most of the year, and then they got up against opponents with like talent, with similar sure. athletes, and they could not stop them uh, in the two biggest games. Right. So what's your sense of kind of how Jim Knowles adjusts and what this group looks like this year. First of all, I thought Jim Knowles did a great job. I mean, for the, through the first 11 games, highly improved, especially in the big play category. Yep. But when they played Michigan, I don't think I've seen those two teams, as far as from a Trent's perspective, look so different and, 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 and tilted toward one direction. I Meaning Michigan yeah. was, was way better in the trenches up front, and this was without their top running back. I remember Quorum was hurt for that game. Donovan Edwards comes in, has a huge game, and up front, they got beat up. I mean, there was explosive plays left and right. Jim Knowles then comes out and says, you know what, we're going to try to limit explosive plays in the playoff. And at times they did that, but 
down the stretch, they have a defensive back fall down, which lets you know Georgia get back in the game. And so there's just way too many explosive plays for what you would expect from Ohio State. And unfortunately, at Ohio State, you're judged on the Michigan game and the playoff game. It doesn't really matter what you do with an odd cut against Bowling Green or whoever. It's You've got to be good in those games, and they, they simply weren't. Eight plays of 45 yards or longer given up in those last two games. Mm. And you mentioned the Michigan game. Michigan ran for 172 yards in the fourth quarter. Mm. Talk about sealing the game with a four with <laughs> yeah. a four minute drill. It was the fourth quarter drill, right? Yeah, yeah. Back on Big Ten today, our big stat focusing on the QB position. The Big Ten losing two of the top five in conference history in touchdown passes. Sean Clifford of Penn State, C.J. Stroud of Ohio State, both moving on. And who succeeds C.J. Stroud is a major topic of conversation in Columbus. And with that in mind, we brought out the heavy hitters. Tim May, senior reporter for Letterman Row, been covering OSU football for 40 years. He joins us yeah. now, and, and Tim, let's dive right into this. It, it is the biggest topic. Ryan Day saying no decision has been made yet between Devin Brown and Kyle McCord. Is it your belief that this is an issue, or is this just a function of them having two really good guys and wanting to get the decision right? Well, you know what, Dave, as you all know, we don't get to watch every practice. Matter of fact, we were <clears throat> glad when you guys rolled into town because we, we got to watch a whole practice, <laughs> which really didn't answer the question. But uh, I really believe it's uh, a conflict in, in Ryan Day's mind, but a good one the way he is portrayed it. You know, if he's not telling us the truth, then shame on him. But <clears throat> he and the coaches and the players all agree that these guys are pretty are pretty tight in this race, and they're waiting for some separation you know, which may or may not come. And, you know, whether Ohio State goes into the season playing two quarterbacks, which I could see, I could see happening. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I think the more urgent question was answered in, in preseason camp of what the starting offensive line was going to look like. I think they've got two very capable, two guys who were labeled as can't miss uh, quarterback prospects uh, in their respective uh, years when they were recruited. I think they're going to be in good hands no matter who ends up being the full-time starter. All right, you brought up the O-line, so I wanted to ask you about that at some point. Let's dive into it now. I, I know that Ryan Day had expressed kind of in the spring and then early on here in preseason camp that they felt like they had good players. It was just a matter of where the pieces fit together. How do you feel like it all ended up? Like, is, is your sense that he's comfortable with where they are? Yeah, I mean, I think when they made the switch, because uh, they were like moving parts around, but when they made the switch of Josh Simmons, the transfer from San Diego State, uh, from right tackle to left tackle, and they moved Josh Fryer from left tackle to right tackle, uh, you know, he played on the right side last year, even started and, and played an entire game against Indiana uh, last year on the right side. Uh, I think they found their magic potion because you've got both, you know, guards back and Matt Jones and Donovan Jackson. It looks like Carson Hensman uh, is going to win that center spot, uh, although he's being pushed by a transfer from Louisiana Monroe, Victor Cutler. But uh, jo uh, Josh Simmons, man, he looks the part. And uh, I think he's impressed people from the get-go when he first showed up in the middle of May and it's just gotten better. And what you have to keep in mind, Dave, and you know, I think you guys even covered this, you know, he was recruited by Justin Fry when Justin Fry was at UCLA uh, way back when. And opted to stay near home in Sa at San Diego State, but uh, he looks ready to rock and roll. And you know, the funny thing is, uh, you know, he's got 13 starts under his belt last year at right tackle for uh, for San Diego State. So he's got a lot of experience he's bringing with him. I want to zoom out to the big picture here, Tim, and and just kind of the temperature of the fan base. Maybe would be the best way to put it. I mean, this is a team that was in the playoff yeah. last year. They came within one play of knocking off the eventual national champ. And I think had they won that game, a lot of us believe they would have been the national champion. And yet you still get this undercurrent, at least I do, from a little bit more of a distance than where you are, get a little bit of an undercurrent of eh, it doesn't feel like everything's perfect in the eyes of, of the fans and maybe even some people who cover the team. What's your sense of kind of where things are big picture with this program? You know this, Dave. We're this is the blender world, man. We're living in bouillie base world because number one, Ohio State might have been a play away from not only playing for the national championship but winning it, as you pointed out. But they had all, all, all at, 
before that had lost us for the second straight year to Michigan, you know, the game. And uh, before that, Ohio State had lost only uh, one game in the previous, what, 20 to Michigan. So uh, it's, it's a, it's, it is a mix. And, you know, and I think it's mixed up also from the fact of how the defense sort of uh, fell away the last three games of the year, starting with the Maryland game and indefinitely against Michigan and Georgia, uh, giving up those huge plays, which changed not just games, but changed the season for them. So the, 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 the question for fans, I think, is number one, number one, who is the starting quarterback? Number two, has the defense, uh, is it in a renaissance now? Uh, Jim Knowles seems to, the second year defensive coordinator seems to indicate it is. He's even changed some of his tactics, some of uh, the way he is looking at playing in defense this year based on the way the year ended last year. And uh, so that's why there's a little bit of mixed emotions. But I don't think anybody doubts that this team is loaded talent wise, uh, literally from top to bottom. I want to dive into a little bit of what you just said there. You said that Jim Knowles is going to maybe change some tactics. And to me, the thing that stood out last year obviously was, look, they're going to gamble some and they're going to give up some big plays. And I'm not sure that jibes with kind of – like I don't understand why you'd play defense that way at Ohio State. Why wouldn't you just play conservatively and not let people get behind you when yeah. you've got a, a high-powered offense? Is it your belief – that Jim Knowles is going to approach things differently. Is that what you were talking about of a tactical difference, or is there something else that you were hinting at there? No, that's what Jim Knowles was talking about when we got to talk to him the other day. And, uh, you know, I wrote a story after the Georgia game. I mean, when you look back on that season, man, you're talking about a 4 2 5 defense that has three safeties on the field. Uh, that was the original premise, you know, when he showed up from Oklahoma State. And, uh, uh, and you got three saves on the field and nobody's deep, you know, nobody's covering the waterfront, so to speak. And, you know, he's addressed that just in his approach. Uh, uh, this, this calling this a four, two, five defense may be a misnomer more and more as this year goes along. Cause I think you're going to see more of a conventional approach. And here's the thing, you know, he was at Oklahoma state where you kind of had to rob Peter to pay Paul from a, from a talent standpoint. You had to come up with, uh, for one of another term gimmicks, uh, I don't think his 425 defense was considered a gimmick, especially the last year at Oklahoma State. But you don't necessarily have to do that when you have great athletes at every position. And you guys, I keep bringing up, you guys were there. You saw number six, Sonny Styles, running around, right? Uh, he's got to be on the field. He's going to be one of those, quote, safeties, end quote, one of those three safeties. But they can mix and match and do all kinds of things with him without sending new personnel in there. But the idea of just attacking – and not covering the waterfront on the backside, uh, he's addressed that. And uh, calling it conservative may not be the right way of putting it, but you always got to have a safety deep, right? And I think that's going to be a big change you're going to see. They're going to play uh, maybe more zone than even they did last year, especially with the corners. Uh, not necessarily look, trying to keep guys from uh, obvious mismatches when they occur. I think uh, I think Michigan especially did a great job of scouting Ohio State as the year went on and found out where there were some mismatches they could uh, exploit. Uh, the, the key this year is to just play guys almost straight up, like as you pointed out, and get after it with talent. And there's no lack of talent, that's for sure. There's no lack of talent I'm on trying. offense either. Yeah. There is a change there with Brian Hartline as the new offensive coordinator. How do you believe that he is settling into that spot, particularly now that Ryan Day has said it will be Day who will once again be doing most of the play calling rather than his OC? Kind of expected that. You know, it's kind of like a race car driver getting out of a car and then letting somebody else drive it, and you're kind of going, wait a minute, but I know where <laughs> all the buttons are. I know where the gas pedal is. And here's the thing, really, Dave, that changed at the end of the year last year in that Georgia game. Ohio State went on the attack, went aggressive, threw the ball down the field. And I'm not trying to uh, sound like I'm a big uh, soothsayer, but that's what I was pushing about uh, in things I talked about, wrote about, et cetera, near the end of the regular season was they, they were playing a little bit timid, you know, offensively, and there was no reason to do that. And that's the kind of a hell-bent attitude that, that Brian Day has brought through the, through the offseason, through spring, through the preseason camp, is they're going to be on the attack uh, in some form or fashion all the time playing aggressive. And I think Ryan Day, we all expected him to step back when he said he was going to, but we also all expected him to step back up now as the season gets closer. You know, and Brian Hartline, I think anybody 
I think a lot of people are capable of calling plays uh, because you're not just you know pulling plays out of your back pocket. You've got lists, you know, third and four uh, at this part of the field, that part of the field, that part of the field. What do you call things like that? But there, there is an art to it too, and he's going to be Brian Hart bring Brian Hartline along, but I think that little bit of time where he spent not being the uh, play caller, not being the offensive coordinator, has allowed him allowed him to put a little more focus on the defense to get some things straightened out that he saw was wrong with the team as it left the field against Georgia, and I think they've addressed that uh, I, I think they've addressed that well in the offseason. Tim, I'm going to leave you with one last question. It is simple, yet I think it's somewhat profound. I think it, it taps into what we're talking about here with the mentality of this program. How do you define success for Ohio State this year? That, that's almost unfair. Because what if you make the college football playoff, I think that's, that is success in this modern world. Yep. Will it be next year when there's 12 teams involved? That may change it. I think Ohio State is equipped to run the table and get back to the college football playoff. I mean, if you hold it over anybody's head, you've got to win a national championship or else. You know, that's folly. That's stupid. Uh, but I think this team is capable of running the table and getting to the college football playoff. That would be success. And then, you know, who are you matched up with? Is it a good matchup? But uh, I think getting back to the, the Big Ten championship game and winning it is is definitely job one for this Ohio State football team. Tim May from Letterman Row, always appreciate your insights on the Buckeyes. Thanks a lot for taking the time out. I always enjoy talking to you, Dave. You know that, man. All right. Thanks, my friend. One of the all-time greats in the Big Ten, LeVar Arrington, on the linebacker position there. You yourself, an All-American linebacker in Illinois. What did you think of LeVar's assessment of the position? Well, I thought it was accurate, right? I mean, you do have to be nasty and be up front. You have to be able to cover. And I was sharing with you a little bit off air that one of my special teams coaches said, you know, LeVar Arrington actually played gunner on the punt team, the guy who goes down and, and you know, tackles the uh, punt return. He said, we watched him play, and he was the most dominant gunner we ever saw. He would just ragtag the defensive backs, you know, and I think they knew right then, oh, we got something special here at Penn State, and obviously, you know, is now a legend. Yeah, incredible. Incredible athleticism and obviously a very physical player as well. Just one of the all-time greats to a Profound play leaping ability position. as well yes, would the, be another adjective. The play against Ohio right. State is be another all right, yeah. so. all-time all -time great play. Uh, let's get into the big five. We're doing this each and every day, counting down to the year top five at each position. And we decided we were going to go with safeties, actually. Sure today, but since we had you in, we decided like we it. would do linebackers instead. Yeah. So, give us your top five, starting with number five. And number five's kind of a guy that most people don't know about, and that's Tariq Barnes from the University of Illinois. He's a sixth-year player, recruited by Lovey Smith. Doesn't have flashy numbers, but I tell you what, they're going to need some production this year from their back seven. We know that the front four, very, very stout, but their safeties made a ton of plays last year, whether it was Quan Martin or Sidney Brown. They made the majority of the tackles. I think Tariq Barnes is a guy you're going to see break out with those big defensive linemen in front of him. He's got the athleticism to run side to side, but also the power to take on the straight on attacks. And we were talking earlier in the show that Brett Bielema loves Atkinson Coleman as well, so... You think about how good that front seven could sure. be for Illinois this year, maybe to make up for some of that inexperience in the secondary. Who's number four? Junior Colson from Michigan. This is a guy that uh, you talk about having length, strength, and speed. Uh, this is the guy right here, Junior Colson, 6'3", 247. Very, very productive. Over 100 tackles last year from Michigan, but also has a tendency to make the big play when you need it. I love his hands, the way he uses his eyes to recognize plays, to recognize plays even before the snap, so the pre-snap recognition. Very, very smart football player. Kind of epitomizes the athleticism and physicality of that Michigan front. I really like Junior Colson at number four. You mentioned the tackle totals, one of just four four returning players in the Big Ten with more than 100 tackles mm. a season to go. Who's number three? Muma John Mehta from Wisconsin. Good job about versatility. Wisconsin linebackers are often called to blitz in Jim Leonard's scheme. I think they'll have some blitzing in uh, Mike Tressel's scheme as well, but he's a guy that has the size that can really take on some of the bigger offensive linemen. They call it block destruction. That basically means destroying the block, shedding the block with your hands. Very, very physical player, smart linebacker in a long line of very smart and physical linebackers that Wisconsin has had. Had a blast talking to him. We'll 
when we were down there. In fact, it was last weekend. I guess it was Saturday. He is incredibly personable. You would like him a lot. It reminded me of covering a Jay Lehman in 2007, a guy who wanted oh. to engage you in conversation yeah. and find out a little bit about you. And uh, yeah, really awesome, really remarkable guy. What about number two? Well, we're going to go back to Penn State. Abdul Carter, who is ironically, or not ironically, wearing the number 11, which is kind of a sacred linebacker number, yes. right? Colt Stick City, you kind of saw it on the shirt of uh, LeVar Arrington right there, established in 1997, it said. So, you know, I like Abdul Carter, and I think Navarro Bo Bo uh, Bowman wore 11, Brandon Bell wore 11. So uh, th these are a lot of guys that have played good football for Penn State. When I talk about athleticism and making big plays, whether that be on the edge, uh, this guy had more big plays arguably than Micah Parsons is freshman. He didn't have as many tackles, right? We know what Micah Parsons is doing for the Cowboys, but he's kind of in that mold. And James Franklin, to really take the next step in that Big Ten East, he's going to need some big explosive plays on defense where they're able to get some points or at least set their offense for a short field. You mentioned Micah Parsons, another number 11. It was amazing to watch Carter in practice. I mean, oh, yeah? when, when guys were up against him, in well blitz pickup drills there was actually one time where singleton was able to stop Square him, him up. Uh, yeah. and and singleton was so thrilled right he was shocked yes it, it was you know as if he had scaled mount everest but when you saw him i mean on some of these drills going up against the offensive line which is really good well, there well i was listening to manny diaz yeah. talk about the defensive coordinator there and manny diaz said you know what's interesting about abdul carter is that he makes the simple look extraordinary he's doing drills and you're like wow it looks so Easy, right? And then you watch the other guy go, that guy looks a little stiff compared to Abdul. You know, so he makes the simple look easy. I think Manny's really excited about what he can bring to the table. Right, and Manny Diaz is so good at scheming and putting right. guys in advantageous positions. So it's a potent combination. So if he's number two, number one, we already were talking about Tommy Eichenberg. So yeah, we, we, we've got to go with Tommy right, Eichenberg. Right, okay. I mean, I mean he, he's a guy that, you know, jumped from about 60-some tackles in 2021 to 120 tackles in 2022. Highly productive, uh, voted the leader. I mean, Ryan Day was saying, hey, there was, you know, between him and Cade Stover, it was far and away. These guys were the leaders of the football team. That's what you want from your middle linebacker. I think for Tommy Eichenberg, he's a guy that's highly productive, but I think he's got a chip on his shoulder from the Michigan game, from the Georgia game. And the knock is this on, on Ohio State's defense. If you run right at it, sometimes you can have success. If you try to run around it, you don't usually get around Ohio State's defense, but if you're in right at it. I think Tommy Eichenberg's the guy that can lead the charge to saying, you know what, we are a physical defense even when you attack us straight on. And Tommy's the guy to lead him back to that. Great to see him come back for his final year. How did you separate Eichenberg and Carter? Like what made you make I, Eichenberg? I think yeah, you look at the production that Eichenberg had and the longevity he's had. I think Abdul Carter has a chance to uh, have more um, – we would call it uh, explosive plays on defense, you know, tackles for loss or sacks, maybe interceptions. I think Eichenberg is your meat and potatoes, going to make your plays play in and play out throughout the drives. Could be a 10, 15, 16 tackle game here and there for him. And right now I gave him the edge because he's a little bit more experienced. 120 tackles last year, to your point, as you said, that is the most of any returning player in the Big Ten. So if you're looking at production, certainly he Tommy produces. Eichenberg, yeah, he, is, he has really been good. We are one day from the return of women's volleyball to the Big Ten Network. A huge doubleheader in the Big Ten Big 12 Challenge tomorrow. First number two, Wisconsin squaring off with 15th ranked Baylor. Then it's 7th ranked Minnesota against TCU. Coverage begins at 5.30 Eastern, powered by Unleaded 88. Only on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. Those are the first two of a record 55 volleyball matches this year. On the Big Ten Network, Emily Eamon will be on the call for those, and she joins us now. Emily, let's start with the big picture of this league. Four of the top eight teams in the country in the preseason poll. Is it safe to say this is the best conference in the country? Every single year, the Big Ten is the best conference in the country. I mean, the numbers that this conference puts up and the ability to reach the Final Four, to reach 
reach deep in the tournament every single year. It's an insanely competitive conference. You know, six teams in the top 15, four in that top 10 with Illinois also receiving votes in that top 25. But one thing I'm looking at, too, is those middle of the pack teams. So a team like Maryland, a team like Indiana, those teams are getting better and better. Purdue continuously pushing up into that top five as well. So this conference, it's not just those teams at the top. The teams in the middle are also getting better to really push those top teams. Let's dive into those matches tomorrow, and I want to start with Wisconsin, a team that gets a ton of headlines justifiably. They've won this conference four years in a row. They are taking on a Baylor in that matchup. Let's start with the Badgers. What's the biggest strength of Wisconsin, do you believe, entering this season? Wisconsin's biggest strength is easily their physicality. They are a very tall team. They're an aggressive team. And this is also a team that is very comfortable with each other. So they have the talent to do exactly what they did last season. The only big piece that they lost was middle blocker Danielle Hart. But they brought in Carter Booth from Minnesota, who put up very similar numbers to that fifth year. Um, but she's going to be an incredible asset to them. Again, a physical middle up front. She's about six seven, So it's tough to get past her. But this block from Wisconsin, year in and year out, they are one of the best. They're always one of the top blocking teams in the nation. I wouldn't expect them to take any steps back, especially with bringing back that core front row. But again, I mean, last year, you look at their offense as well. They were the most efficient in the Big Ten and scoring the most points. And now you add another big offensive piece to that with Temi Thomas-Ilara on the outside. And all around, they are the most complete team. They're the most physical team. And their offense is going to be looking really good. How does Thomas Alara fit into this roster, which is already loaded? Yeah, and that was the biggest question coming into the season was where do you even put her? Of course, you have to get Temi on the court because she's one of the strongest hitters. I think she hits harder than anybody in the entire country, but she really adds that firepower aspect. You know, she led Northwestern in kills all her four years. She led the Big Ten during conference play with 4.6 kills per set. But how she fits into that lineup, it'll be interesting because you have outside Sarah Franklin, who's been cleared to play, who was Wisconsin's top hitter returning from last season. But then you have Yulia Orgel, who also is consistent for them. She's their best passer on the team. So I know they tried a few things during their scrimmage. They actually tried Orgel in that libero jersey because she is such a good passer. But at the end of the day, you have to get Temi on the court. But now it becomes a question of can she dominate on a national championship contending team and put up the same numbers as she did at Northwestern, which arguably was not as strong of a program. But she held that load for so long playing against some of those top teams. But can she do it for a team with those pieces around her that are also going to elevate her play? What about this matchup with Baylor? Give us a little feel for the Bears, a team that actually beat Wisconsin a year ago in this same event. One of just four teams on their schedule last year to beat them. How good is Baylor? Yeah, Baylor looks a little bit different than they did last season. So this is a very young team. They graduated a lot of players. They had a few players transfer out as well. So they actually don't have any seniors. And this is Ryan McGuire, the head coach. It's his first year not having any seniors. So they don't have that leadership necessarily. I think the biggest thing for both Wisconsin and Minnesota going in is they want to kind of shake them up. So you have a lot of young players. Uh, you want to get them rattled early on. You have to start fast against a team like Baylor, especially when you have a lot of young players. So Sometimes those front row players are just going to start bombing balls because they want to take risks. They want to see what works for their team. Um, and that's going to be a big point of emphasis for Baylor. So Wisconsin and Minnesota have to shut them down quickly. One other thing to note is they put a lot of emphasis on that back row attack. So that's another point of emphasis for the defense. So for Wisconsin and Minnesota, they have to find a way to shut down that back row attack pretty early on. Let's turn our attention to the Gophers, who you were touching on a little bit there. I'm fascinated by this transition here. Keegan Cook taking over for Hugh McCutcheon. We know what a legend McCutcheon was at Minnesota. Cook had a similar situation at Washington, where he took over for a legendary coach there and did a tremendous job not just maintaining the program, but some might argue even elevating it in some regards. How much pressure, though, is on him to be good right away, particularly with a very good roster that he inherits. There's a lot of pressure on Keegan Cook this season. It's never easy to follow one of the greats with Hugh McCutcheon, you know, a national coach of the year honor, 
two Big Ten titles, four Final Fours. The expectation for Minnesota's program is just that. They want to get a national title. They want to make a Final Four. But Keegan Cook is no stranger to rebuilding programs. And not only rebuilding, but really just adding on. I mean, I think of, you know, the first week he signs on to the job, he signs the best libero in the country in libero Kylie Murr coming from Ohio State. So you can already see the players having so much trust in him. And I think what makes him really stand out is He's not trying to remake this program. He knows that they have great talent. He's just trying to really add to what's already established. And one thing he does really, really well, which he did at Washington, is he's really into technique and he's really into statistics. I know you spoke to them the other day about, you know, how into math he is, but he really shows that to his teams. He'll break film down frame by frame to show them if there's one slight step in the wrong position, getting them really fundamentally sound is is key for him. And then statistics, he really lies on relies on what's going to work for his team. If he can find literally any advantage possible, he's going to do that. One other thing that he really focuses on is serving. And I think Minnesota over the last few years has not been a particularly good serving team. But you look at Keegan Cook's old Wisconsin or Washington teams, they're one of the best serving teams in the country year in and year out. That's the biggest jump I would expect this Minnesota team to take, where they already have the fine-tuned offense. You put Kylie Murr in the libero jersey, your defense is pretty solid. So serving is a question mark that I think he's really going to solve and really get them up to pace in the Big Ten, trying to get teams out of system. You bet your Murr. She was the defensive player of the year in the conference last year. They also have the conference player of the year in Taylor Landfair coming back. What can she do for an encore here? Yeah, I think now the expectation has been set for her. She's trying to repeat to go Big Ten Player of the Year two years in a row. And thinking back to what she did last season, so thinking back all the way to 2021, she was injured most of the year. She comes back into 2022 and earns that Player of the Year honor. It's a remarkable story. And, you know, finishing first in the Big Ten and top 20 in the country in points per set, the numbers that she put up were incredible. And and one thing I know she's really honing in on is, yes, of course, elevating her offense becoming a better blocker and passer, but she's really trying to become a better leader for this team, especially in this transition period when you bring in a new head coach, you had a few key players transfer out of the program, you have players coming into the program. She's developed into an incredible leader for this team that they really need with that coaching change and personnel change, but she's also reaching for more. You know, of course she wants that Big Ten Player of the Year honor, but she's looking deeper. You know, she wants that National Player of the Year honor, and a lot of that is contingent on how well this Minnesota team does so how well and how deep they can make it into the tournament they had an early exit last year at least from what they thought playing Ohio State getting out early but I think a player like Taylor Landfair is going to handle that pressure very well I mean she's an elite athlete I'm um, in terms of mindset she's also elite in that way so I wouldn't expect her to take any steps back well they have a brutal schedule from the get-go a TCU would be the only unranked team they play in the first six TCU's a team that made the NCAA tournament, though, a year ago, first time in six years. What can you tell us just thumbnail about the Frogs? Yeah, TCU lost a lot of pieces, but they they still have some studs. They have an outside Audrey Knowles, who is one of the best in the country, and they have to key in on her. She led the Big 12 in kills, kills per set, points and points per set last season. She's a firepower, explosive outside, and along with one of the fastest offenses in the country. So last season, we saw that Minnesota, they ran their offense with lightning speed. TCU's the exact same way. The speed at which the ball comes out of the setter's hands and gets even to the pins is lightning fast. So it'll be fun to watch Minnesota and TCU go at it because of how quick the game's going to be. But the biggest thing is you have to slow down that speed for TCU. Have to find a way to get them out of system, whether that's keeping the ball in the setter, getting them out of system from the service line, but getting that speed to go down down and trying to neutralize that is is going to be big. Emily, we're one day from the start of the season, so this is the last day that we can make any kind of preseason prognostication. So before I let you go, let's just say hypothetically Wisconsin doesn't win the league this year. I'm not saying that you're saying they won't. I'm just saying, like, let's take the four-time defending champ out of the picture. If for some reason they were not to repeat and they did not win it, who would win it? It's a toss-up between three teams, but I think if I had to give it to anyone, I, I might 
give it to Minnesota. I, I think that they're going to surprise some people this year. What they lacked last season was that really good defensive core. And they had a good libero, but she didn't have the greatest season. So adding in Kylie Murr to this team, I think, stabilizes that. Their offense is already very fine-tuned. The biggest question mark is, do they have two middle blockers on the roster that can handle that Big Ten load? Now, you look at other teams, too, like a Nebraska or a Penn State. Nebraska's a very young team, but Coach Cook also has the ability to make his teams greater than the sum of their parts. You know, they brought in a rock star freshman setter. They brought in a really incredible right side. So Nebraska, of course, could give Wisconsin a run for their money like they try to do every year. And another team that I think doesn't get talked about enough right now is Penn State. They added two top players with Mac Pedraza, the reigning setter of the year. And then you get Jess Merzik in there and outside from Michigan, who I wouldn't be surprised to see her win Big Ten Player of the Year at the end of the season. So there really are three teams in the mix right there that could contend with Wisconsin. But in my opinion, I think it's Wisconsin versus the world right now. I think this is the most complete team. They have all the pieces to do it. And I would be very surprised if they didn't win their fifth straight Big Ten title. Uh, it should be an amazing year. I mean, 15 of the 18 first team all conference players from a year ago are back in the Big Ten <laughs> This year, so many great teams, so many great players. Looking forward to following it all with you, Emily, and hearing you document it, starting with those games coming up tomorrow. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. Promise top storylines for the season. I think we promised four of them. Four. So we're going to need you to deliver. Let's start with number four. Well, number four is the four new head coaches in the Big Ten West, starting with Luke Fickle. I mean, probably the most high-profile coach out there that you could probably hire. Went to a playoff with Cincinnati. But what does Wisconsin look like in the post, I won't say Barry Alvarez area because he's there, but as far as identity of a football team, right? This has been a run-first, ground-pound team for about 30 years. We've got Phil Longo, the offensive coordinator, who's an air raid guy. Has done great with you know guys like Sam Howell and, and making plays all over the field. So that's, that's unique. I think Matt Rule, what does Nebraska look like? That's a rebuild. They're not going to be great initially, but I think they're going to be in the right direction. He rebuilt Temple. He rebuilt Baylor. I'd say those are arguably tougher rebuilds than what he's doing right now at Nebraska. But what does that look like and what is their identity? We talked a little bit about Ryan Walters and being a first-time head coach in the Big Ten. We don't get a ton of those. Usually you're... Get a little experience on a Ryan Day. You know, he had some high-level coordinator experience, but that was something, too. And, you know, you look at David Braun, that's a tricky situation for Northwestern. Very difficult, no doubt. Number yeah. three. Expansion. I know we've always talked about it. When's it going to stop? When's it going to end? And it's not all about what the Big Ten does. It's about uh, Big 12 got Colorado that opened some doors for Washington and Oregon for the Big Ten. Uh, I'm sorry, the Big 12 got Colorado, and the ACC is talking to other teams. No one knows what's going to happen, but I think the biggest shift is we might not have divisions next year, but we will have a 12-team playoff, which could be a big deal for a lower-level school to – not lower-level, I shouldn't say it, but a mid-tier Big Ten team play in the playoff. That could be a memorable football team. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, if you make the playoff from a team that doesn't traditionally make it, you will be a team sure. that will be talked about for decades. Yeah, no, it, no it, question. it'd be like going to a, a New Year's Six bowl game right yeah. now, which is yep. special. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so those are your, your top two storylines. What are your last two here? Who challenges Ohio State and Michigan for the Big Ten? I think the obvious answer is Penn State has the talent. Can they take that next step? But there's always a team that kind of comes out of the woodwork. I think last year, nobody saw Purdue win in the West, right? Nobody saw Wisconsin falling off. How fast can Wisconsin get back to their typical Big Ten West form? What team is going to challenge? I think Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, all the chance out of the West, including Penn State. Yeah, I agree with the first one you talked about, though. It is a huge year for Penn State sure. because all the pieces are in place there for them to compete at the very Big top. time quarterback, offensive line that can make it happen, and lots of talent on defense. What are you leaving us with? Final one. Can the Big Ten beat Georgia in the national championship, <laughs> right? Can the Big Ten champ... Yeah, which, yeah, yeah I got the Bulldogs in the top. Well, yeah, have you looked at the Bulldogs schedule? Uh, no. uh, my sixth grade football team schedule matched up to that. I mean, Come I mean, on, man. I mean it's, it's, <laughs> it's by SEC standards, it's a little bit on the lighter side. Let's just say that. Yeah. I think people have them penciled in to be the, at least in the playoff... Probably the national champion with who they have coming back. And the question is, is can the Big Ten champ, which usually makes it into the playoff, beat Georgia? And I thought Ohio State, we would all agree for three quarters, outplayed Georgia, right? right. And, 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 and because of mental errors and some, some mistakes down the stretch, gave that game away. So can they get over the hump and beat Georgia? One play away. Georgia trying to win three straight national championships. Last team to do that, Minnesota mm. in the 1930s. Wow. Who are the Big Ten can unseat them. 
Great stuff. Thanks, Jack.